This is a story about the persuasive power of music and the effect it has on the collective unconscious. It's a story of war, of mind control, and of half price sales at the Kmart. Welcome to Ordinary Things, where ordinary things are explained. Today's ordinary thing, Muzak, the soundtrack to mid-century elevators and prefrontal lobotomies. But what is Muzak? The genre known as Muzak is a style of instrumental background music, characterized by repetition and simple arrangements inspired by classical or popular songs. Also known as elevator music or piped music, it's designed to be played in commercial spaces with the expressed purpose of altering people's mood and behavior. So where did Muzak come from? Much like Xeroxing, jet skis and onesies, we know Muzak by the name of the company that created it. The Muzak company was founded in 1922 by a man named George Square. Before inflicting soft jazz on the unsuspecting public, Square had an illustrious career with the world's biggest military and the Middle East's worst wedding crashes, the US Army. In World War I, he devised a way to transmit secret radio messages using living trees as antennae. After the war, he swapped trees for telephones. As the Muzak company's first product was a device that sent music through telephone lines, charging customers monthly on their utility bill. But the service was soon eclipsed by developments in radio technology, and because who'd want to pay a monthly fee just to listen to music on their phone? So it wasn't until the 1940s that the Muzak company found its true, irritating purpose. What you're hearing now is Paradise Program, recorded by Muzak's in-house orchestra. It's energetic but bland, motivational yet mundane. It's the kind of music that might inspire you to do your taxes or take the bins out. And it was also a fixture in Muzak's highly successful Stimulus Progression program. By 1936, Muzak was selling the idea that background music could substantially increase productivity in the workplace. They began producing packages of motivational music designed to be pumped into factories and offices. These recordings were organized into alternating 15-minute blocks of music and silence. 15 minutes of progressively energetic music designed to encourage work and concentration, followed by 15 minutes of silence to prevent what they called musical fatigue and to stop workers from stuffing industrial tools in their ears. This was stimulus progression, and it became an extremely popular idea during the manufacturing boom of World War II. American military services enjoyed virtually unchecked control over their spending. So manufacturers were certain they could sell their products, and lots of them. Their only challenge was keeping their workforce efficient and making sure they had enough pockets to stuff all their cash into. Muzak's promise of a magic productivity playlist took off, and soon every factory floor in America was alive with the the sound of Muzak. But then, a man named Hitler ruined the fun for everyone by blowing his brains across a bunker wall. Factory-owning fat cats were left wondering who was going to buy all their mass-produced crap when they weren't living in a war economy anymore. But luckily, the Muzak company had an answer for that too. Muzak in the 1950s was a lot like Joe Rogan now. No one really liked it or listened to it before, but suddenly it was fucking everywhere. This was because Muzak's best paid pseudoscientists made an excellent and persuasive case that music could have a powerful effect on shoppers. This is Holiday for Strings, originally composed by David Ross and re-recorded by Seaberg, one of Muzak's main competitors. It's slow, slightly unnerving to modern ears, but essentially the oral equivalent of wallpaper. It's music that doesn't draw attention to itself, and this was the point. Retail Muzak was designed to work on a subliminal level. Studies showed that slow-paced, inoffensive music encouraged shoppers to linger longer in store. Muzak called this dwell time, time for shoppers to make more impulse purchases and behave like the consumerist cattle we all know we are. You're a good little drone, aren't you? Now do a dance. Do it. Good boy. Some department stores took the subliminal Muzak philosophy a step further by installing little black boxes that mixed music with barely audible anti-theft messages that would repeat 9,000 times an hour. Now, was all this strictly legal? The answer is, absolutely. It was. Still is. But luckily, modern audiences are much too sophisticated to fall for anything like that. Most famously, Muzak was also pumped into elevators. Well, we're all used to elevators now, but when they were first introduced, people saw them for what they were. Flying domiciles of disequilibrium with the ability to malfunction and turn you into human soup. 
background music soothed elevator riders, alleviated boredom, and made accidental eye contact with other passengers less awkward. At its peak, Muzak boasted over 100 million daily listeners slash victims. It was pumped into restaurants, into ocean liners, and into my recurring nightmare where I'm chased down the never-ending corridor by Alex Jones's pulsating face. But it also made it to the White House. In 1953, President Eisenhower made his contribution to the musical industrial complex by wiring the White House for Muzak. And President Kennedy was piping those slow jams on Air Force One. Well, when he wasn't piping Hollywood starlets and White House staffers. And Lyndon B. Johnson loved Muzak almost as much as he loved shitting with the door open, as he actually owned a Muzak franchise in Austin before he was president. Muzak even made it into outer space, as NASA played it on the Apollo missions as a way to calm astronauts during takeoff. So while we may imagine the moon mission sounding like this, they probably sounded more like this. But Muzak was a victim of its own success, and the public started to turn against the genre in that culturally quiet and rarely discussed decade of the 1960s. By the late 1960s, Muzak became a punchline for anything generic and uninspired, especially because popular music had become a vehicle for radical social change, revolution, and not washing your hair. Muzak was literally the sound of the establishment. It was not designed for the enjoyment of listeners, but for their manipulation. It was music made for the benefit of the person who was playing it. It's like the guy who brings his acoustic guitar to the house party. It doesn't matter how well he plays, everyone's still gonna think he's a knob. The company remained on life support for decades until finally declaring bankruptcy in 2009, where it was subsumed by Mood Media two years later. But where the company faltered, its sound emigrated and evolved. It could be argued that the emergence of the ambient electronic genre in the 1970s was a direct consequence of Muzak's influence. The godfather of ambient and human drumstick, Brian Eno, actually cites Muzak as a sort of anti-inspiration for his seminal, insomnia-curing opus, Music for Airport. And a stable of ambient musicians have continued to blur the boundary between music and noise ever since. Aphex Twin, Tangerine Dream, Gorilla Kidney, Phila Brasilia, the list goes on, and I only made one of those up. Muzak itself took a long time to fall out of fashion in Japan, and this partly explains its ubiquitous presence in video games. It appears on the in-game iPod of Metal Gear Solid 4, and as literal elevator music in the N64 classic GoldenEye. And then of course there's the iconic buy mode from The Sims, and really this is the perfect post-Muzak application of the Muzak sound. It's the soundtrack for the accumulation of virtual consumer products, specifically designed for your dopamine addled drone brain as it goes about conducting a series of microtransactions as a substitute for any real tangible achievements. And my god, isn't it beautiful? And then of course there's the Wii Shop music, which if you've spent more than six seconds on the internet, needs no introduction. But beyond its sound, Muzak's lasting skid mark on the pant of society was its philosophy. In the 1990s, the ailing company did what it did best – sell jargon to gullible executives with deep pockets. They coined the term quantum modulation, which meant absolutely nothing, but they told people it was about matching music to the needs of specific commercial environments. Companies like Music Concierge and Mood Media continue this legacy as leaders in the booming background music business, or experiential design if you like the smell of your own farts. They design music collections for retail environments that encourage consumer behaviour and attract the store's desired demographics. So while The Gap will play inoffensive pop music to appeal to its broad audience, Urban Outfitters will play something for a younger, trendier crowd. And Hollister will play slowed down nursery rhymes to attract their lucrative simpleton market. Well, it's lucrative when they can remember their credit card number. Classical music is often deployed tactically. It's played in upmarket restaurants because people associate it with quality and are therefore more likely to spend more money. And in the UK, it's frequently deployed in public spaces where drunk people are known to congregate as it pacifies and relaxes them. Fast food establishments pick their playlists carefully as well, using high tempo music to encourage fast customer turnaround. That way, patrons can fill their faces with carbs and corn syrup and go have their heart attack somewhere sufficiently far away from the premises. That is, if they can waddle away fast enough. And this is Muzak's real legacy. Music as a form of social control. If you're listening to music that you didn't intend to hear, then chances are it's been designed for your manipulation. And it's inescapable. 
It's everywhere, from restaurants, to hotel lobbies, to YouTube videos. This has been Ordinary Things. If you like what I've put out so far, please consider donating to my new Patreon page and hit the bell so the next Ordinary Thing can be delivered straight to your face.